I think if you put uh, Tim Tim Geyser, for instance, on a on one of our old bikes, you know, top athlete today, I think you would be, we would all be amazed at the competitiveness that he could show on that bike, or be in it, a bike from the eighties. What's up guys, I'm Max and this is 999 Laser. Last week we uploaded this video all about the history of the CR500 and in it we were lucky enough to bag an interview with three time 500cc world champion Dave Thorpe. However I wasn't able to include the full chat in that edit and I don't think my old man who's holding the camera right now and was a massive Dave Thorpe fan back in the day would ever forgive me if I didn't upload the full interview to this channel. So without further ado, here it is. Good morning. Morning, how are you? You? No, not too bad, not too bad. Good couple of days at the track. Yeah, yeah, we had a good day at Jake's. Um, and then, um, yeah, the second day we were scheduled to go there where we went, but it rained on the first day, so Jake thought it'd be too wet, but the guy he rang and said it was prime and it, 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 he didn't lie, it was. Oh, good. So yeah, yeah good, it, mu good. it must be difficult at the moment trying to find decent places to go, places that will let you yeah. ride. For us, it's not too bad. We're quite lucky because obviously Jake's got his track. Um, Tommy uses Ed's, which works yeah. really well. Um, there's, some other, there's some other private tracks that we can get on. Um, we kind of fall under the elite sport bit, so that's good. But it seems like the weather's getting better here, so as long as yeah. the weather's good, get on tracks is fine. So it's basically, what the project I'm working on, on at the moment is... We're doing a video all about the, the history of the CR500 because we've got a load of videos on our channel with Nev Bradshaw riding the CR500 and the viewers absolutely love the bike. It's the, it's the one bike that anytime we put a video on about it, floods of comments come in, people absolutely love it. There's like a little community formed in the comments of people that used to ride the bike, love the bike. So I thought we'd do a video kind of telling the story of the bike from the first edition to the last edition. And then within that story, obviously, was you guys and what you, you guys achieved on the bike. So I wanted to kind of get your opinion on the machine. And I, I read a, there was a small article on MCN that you'd done. I don't know when it was, but talk, talking about the bike, a couple of quotes on the bike. And I read that and thought, oh, I've got to talk to Dave about the bike because obviously you were one of the most successful CR500 racers of all time. So really my first question is, what was the bike, from your point of view, what was the bike like to ride? I think the the bit that doesn't actually always come across is the bike evolved. So the way it works at uh, HRC generally is you, you have a project manager, you know, you have the person that's uh, behind that Pacific bike. Um, and uh, when, when that bike wins a championship, sometimes that project leader rolls on to the next year. But more often than not, he will kind of step up in the world of Honda. Mm -hmm. um, subsequently, if the bike isn't successful in that year, sometimes that person gets a second chance or that person then is moved left or right in within the Honda uh, family. So... <clears throat> the, the bike evolved through, not through, it was never good enough. It evolved through the times of a new project leader. And as with any business, um, sometimes um, new people come in and they, they sometimes they sweep the whole floor clean. And sometimes they just do a partial clean, but they want to have some accreditation to the project themselves yeah. and if they do roll over and like for like yeah sometimes they don't get the credit uh, that, that maybe their work deserves so from our side the bike evolved through different um persons and time um i think the the thing with the cr 500 was um it was an an incredibly powerful bike that was way ahead of its time um if you think of the kx with kurt and the yamahas whilst the yamahas were clearly more advanced than the kawasaki at that time 
they just wasn't quite on that level of the CR500. So the power was was amazing. The chassis was way ahead of its time. And, you know, people always talk about the raw speed of a 500. And, and yeah, there was. But in the same token, the, the bikes that we rode were also very torquey. You know, in, in some configurations on different surfaces, we could start in third gear. Yeah. Um, and, we only, and we only run a four speed box. Um, so it just gives you some understanding of, of what it was. I mean, if you if you used all the gears and you revved it really high, it would take you to the moon. There's no question. That. I mean, it was it was a wild beast to ride. But if you could hook up the gears and, you know, I didn't always hook up the gears very often. I revved and over revved, as I was told many times. But um, yeah, it uh, it was a a good time to be on the factory Honda that was you know ahead of the rest. When I was looking into all of this, I was looking at the race results and the championship results, and I think it was three seasons every every season that you won, where every man on the box at the end of the year was on a Honda. Yeah, I mean Honda had you know at first Graham um, for the first World Championship that he won in '79. And then there was um, a period where uh, there was four of us when Suzuki stopped and Andre Romans and Eric Gibors come to Honda. Um, and then uh, there was another period where there was the three of us, which was Jeff, Eric and myself. So Honda had a, an eye for looking for uh, people that could win the championship for them. Um, and they didn't necessarily hang their coat on one person. They always tended to try and edge their bets and have two people in there that yeah. potentially. Um, and that's, you know, I think in one year, I think they, they were on the top step of the podium in every Grand Prix. It's the kind of dominance that you, you don't really see back then or now, really, do you? I think the only, well, the only time through looking through history was Suzuki and the 125 class in the kind of like yeah. 70s, early 80s, are the only one, are the only manufacturer that I can see that have had a run of titles that was one one season longer than what the CR500 had. They had 10 titles in a row and CR500 won nine world championships in a row. Yeah, I think, yeah, Honda HRC, the racing division, you know, was incredibly motivated to win in the motocross class then as it is now. Um the only difference is now, obviously, everything costs so much more. Riders, travel, parks, everything. So I think that's why you tend to see now you've got one, if you like, number one rider in the team um, that is is there to, to win. And then you've got um, a second rider that is more cost effective but can still bang in top six results. Yeah. And I think look at all of the teams now, that's generally the way they're going. I saw a quote on the the MCN article that you said that your dad described you watching watching you ride the CR500 as watching some washing on the clothesline hanging off the back of the bike. Was it really that wild? Like you said, it, if you hooked it down a gear, it would take you to the moon. Was it really that wild? Yeah, it could and it would. I mean, I think the, the crutch of it is um, for anybody, irrespective of what year or whatever, yeah, irrespective of in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, now, whatever. To win a world championship, there are times in a season where you've got to ride at 110%. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you'll never be champion. Um, it's not sustainable. You can't do it every week. But there were times when, um, yeah, when you really got to let it go. And yeah, that would be when dad uh, described there's a bit of washing hanging off the back, but it's yeah. um, it's uh, it's not that type of riding, especially on the CRs, was not sustainable because sooner or later it was going to bite you back. And when they did bite back, they bit back hard. Yeah, as, uh, as many of us will vouch for. Yeah, you can just look at the crash compilations from back in that time, and there's some big ones, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, it can. Um, it, and that's the thing with the bike; it could could very easily run away with you if you, if you got loose on it. You said that the bike was way, way ahead of its time. What do you think a, a modern rider would think of a CR500? I think if you put uh, Tim, Tim Geyser, for instance, on a, 
on one of our old bikes, you know, top athlete today. I think you would be, we would all be amazed at the competitiveness that he could show on that bike or be in it, a bike from the 80s. I think uh, it would surprise a lot of people. The bike was around to 2001, wasn't it? But stopped yeah. being developed in the early 90s. So it is tech that's 30 years old pretty much, isn't it? Yeah, and I think if you think, obviously, we've gone from two-stroke to four-stroke now, um, you could put that two-stroke engine in, for instance, Tim's chassis, you know, into the Honda, the modern-day chassis. Um, I think, to be honest, I think it would surprise an awful lot of people because, obviously, chassis and suspension is, is what's really moved on. Um, obviously engines from two stroke to four stroke of course it's moved on and the four stroke is a different type of power not any less or more but in different areas yeah uh, but i think if you could put a cr500 in a modern day chassis i think it would be a phenomenal bike yeah i think i think there's a lot of people that pay a lot of money to see tim geyser ride that bike yeah you know or you know um geyser um ken roxon anybody yeah. like that it would be uh it would be good to watch, but I think it would also, it would genuinely surprise a lot of people because, you know, the the bike was, uh, it was super competitive back in the day. And I still believe in a good shot would be the same. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know if you saw it, but last year, Neville Bradshaw rode his CR500 at the AMCA Championships. I don't know, it's not Tim Geiser and uh, Ken Roxon racing AMA or GP level, but still... He won motos on that bike against modern 450s. Yeah, I watched it, and and to be fair, it's all relevant, isn't it? You know, you know, he's he's a, a been a top rider and still rides very very well against people that are similar abilities. So yeah. you know, kind of should work in a stepping stone up. If you've got someone that's in the prime of their life riding, then I think yeah, you, I think they're probably right. They would surprise a lot of people, especially outdoors. You know, it would. Uh, and it was good to see, you know, it's good to see uh, um, an older bike being competitive in modern day races, really. I think it just goes to show kind of the, the um, artistry of the engineering back back in the, when they was developing the CR500. It stands a testament of time and it's proven, isn't it? Oh, totally. You know, the, the, we always said it was ahead of its time in the day. Um, we still talk about it now and, and that really is justification in what we're all saying, isn't it, really? Yeah, and I, I don't think there's any other bikes that have kind of invoked this kind of reaction from people. I don't think I've seen any. No, and, you know, the, the, the good thing about the, the, the Hondas is they're bulletproof, you know, like those, the bike that Nev's on and many, many people ride the two stroke 250 and 450 uh, sorry 500 and the 125 they're they're pretty reliable bikes yeah. even 30 years old. so that's you know it's always the benefit of dare i say having a honda because they do generally stand the test of time yeah. and i i say it at the in this video you'll see it but can you really see as good as they are today a ktm 450 or a, a honda 450 can you can we really see people still racing them in 30 years time and winning races on them. No, I mean, dare I say, we're probably all electric in 30 yeah. years. Yeah. But no, but um, I think the, 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 pe the people that, the generation that is here right now, I think they will always aspire to the four-stroke bike. Um, and, you know, the people that, you know, maybe late 20s, early 30s will, will always sort of, have a draw to two strokes because that was probably what was around when they were growing up, going to watch the races with their yeah. dads. Well, right, that's um, pretty much all I need from, from you today, Dave. I really appreciate uh, okay. your time, mate. Right. And I'll, uh, I'll make sure to send you the link to the video when it's online, which probably will be later today. Okay, thank you. Hopefully we'll catch up in the season at some point. All right, all right mate. Dave, mega, appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I have to pinch myself every time I get to speak to legends like this. A big shout out goes to Rumpel Stiltskin for being such a valued member of our community. Thanks for the support mate, I really appreciate it. As always guys, I've been Max, this has been 999 Laser. 
Remember to like, share and subscribe. Until next week, I'll see you at the track. <laughs>